Welcome. Um, I'd like to actually welcome you on behalf of the Concord Free Public Library Corporation. Um, I knew people would show up for this wonderful event. <laughs> people in this area are very hardy, and when there's something they want to do, something special like this, they come. So we're really delighted to see you all. Um, also, um, I wanted to let you know in case, I don't know if you do know this, but in our special collections at the library, we have the largest collection of Louisa May Alcott working manuscript in the world. <laughs> um, and um, we're very proud and excited about that, but also to let people know that that is any, anyone at any time can come down to our special collections. You, you can make an appointment or you can just come when, when the department's open and see them, you know, if you, if you would like, if you'd be interested in doing that. And we have some other special Alcott items as well, but that's, you know, one of the, one of the most uh, special of all. Um, so, of course, we're delighted to have Anne Boyd Rue as our speaker tonight, but it is my great pleasure to introduce um, the, cur uh, the curator of our William Monroe uh, Special Collections, and that's Anka Voss. And Anka, please come up. Um, thank you, Sherry, and thank you for the corporation for supporting this event. Um, welcome. Um, so good evening and welcome to tonight's program. Uh, my name is Anka Voss, Curator of Special Collections at the Concord um, Free Public Library. Um, you only need to read um, the headline of our local paper, um, which just this week proclaimed, Oscar Buzz over Little Women Grips Concord. <laughs> <laughs> to know that Concord native Louisa Mayalkin's Little Women uh, novel has been the talk of the town drawing visitors here from near and far to see where it all began, including um, visiting the Concord Free Public Library. Um, our collection, as Sherry already mentioned, has a rich collection of original material relating to the Alcott family. Um, our special collections include both literary manuscripts and personal papers. Notable among those are our holdings or portions of Alcott's Little, Win Little Men and Little Women in manuscript, we hold two chapters from part two of Little Women, Our Foreign Correspondent and Heartache, the only known manuscripts of the novel that survive. Um, and again, as Sarah mentioned, um, I want to concur and affirm that please visit um, us um, to view those wonderful um, treasures. Um, they are here for the community to enjoy and to, uh, to view. Um, it won't come as a surprise then that our speaker had made frequent visits to our reading room, including late last year when she was interviewed in our special collections um, by Rita Braver um, of CBS Sunday Morning in, when I first met her. Um, and the interview on CBS um, Sunday Morning um, is available on a link at our website, so if you haven't uh, had a chance to see it, I encourage you to. It's a wonderful inter interview, um, and which prompted me to um, um, invite our speaker back. So it is with particular excitement that I'm pleased to welcome author and professor Anne boyd -Roux. Anne is the author or editor of six books about American women writers, including the best-selling Meg, Joe, Beth, Amy, the story of little women and why it still matters. She is a professor of the uh, she is a professor of English in New Orleans, and the recipient of two National Endowment of the Humanities fellowships. Published in late 2018, the story of little women in why it still matters marks the 150th anniversary of Alcott's no novel. Anne's book celebrates the novel's history, legacy, and influence. Her book, her book is now available in paperback and an indie bestseller. It is long listed for the Chautauqua Prize and named one of the best books of 2018 by Library Journal, The Daily Mail, and A Mighty Girl. John Matson, Pulitzer Prize winning author of Eden's Outcast, the story of Louisa May Alcott and her father, declared Anne's book firmly persuasive, impeccable, 
the only companion to understanding the novel that most readers are very likely to need. Wow, aren't you glad you made the trip out here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> um, in tonight's presentation, Anne will be speaking about the challenges of adapting Alcott's novel for radio, stage, and screen, and how each era produces its own little women, from the 1912 stage adaption to this year's film adaption by Greta Gerwig. So please join me in welcoming Anne Boyd Wu. Thank you, Anka, for that lovely introduction. Um, it is very special for me to come back to the Concord Free Public Library. And I'm so grateful that Anka invited me back um, because this is, visiting the archives here was a very special part of my research. I had always been told, everyone had been told, right? All the scholarship says that, well, she wrote Little Women so quickly, there was no revision. She dashed it off, you know, straight from manuscript to the page in the books. And I don't think anyone had ever really compared those two surviving manuscript chapters to the published book. Um, there are some very interesting differences. This isn't part of my talk, but do you want to hear what they are? Yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I realized as you all were speaking that I really should talk a little bit about that, because it's, it's just a couple of chapters in my book. Um, and I've been interviewed about it. For CBS Sunday Morning, there was also a New York Times reporter who came out here and we looked at the manuscripts together and she did nothing with it in her story. And the CBS Sunday Morning piece, we looked at the manuscripts, right? You can see them very briefly. And, and keep in mind, in that interview, there, there were, in that segment, they were also interviewing Greta Gerwig and Sir Sharonin and Jan Turnquist. They looked at Orchard House. So I, you know, I was in there a little bit. And, um, we looked at the manuscripts and we saw how Louise Malcott had written on the back, saved at mother's request, which is really remarkable, right? Because she wasn't her practice to keep the manuscripts. Um, she would, you know, she'd burn them as soon as she didn't need them anymore, where they weren't of any value. Well, this was the second half of Little Women. Remember, Little Women was published in two parts. So after the first book was published in September of 1868 and was a runaway bestseller, well, then the second part was a valuable commodity. That's when she started saving manuscripts. And I think the other manuscripts that you have here from her later works. Um, but these two chapters apparently were Abigail's favorites. And they are, they include the, um, our foreign correspondent, Amy's writing home from Europe. She's having lots of adventures. She's having many more adventures, in fact, in the manuscript chapter than she is in the book. <laughs> there must have been an intervening Ver, uh, intervening draft because there's so many changes in that one. Um, she goes to a casino and sees women gambling. Um, this, she picks up this guy on the boat on the way over who's chasing her all around Europe and wanting to marry her. Um, she briefly meets, uh, what's his name? Frank Vaughn. And then she discards him and is on her way. Um, so it's very, very different. And uh, I think she, in, I think she's tones down, Amy. She's a little bit too girls gone wild, you know, running off in Europe. <laughs> so in the book, she becomes, you know, a bit more proper. And then in the other chapter, A Heartache, if you go down and look at it, it's really quite remarkable. This is the chapter where Laurie proposes to Joe and she turns him down, right? And she's telling him no, 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 over and over again. And the, really, the chapter is almost the same in the published version, except for one very important difference. Um, in the manuscript, she's told him no for the last time, and he has to accept it. But before he leaves, he grabs her and kisses her violently. And she scratched it out. And that's not in the book. Isn't that interesting? I think it's really fascinating. And she's scared by the passion in his face. That was also scratched out. And so the published version simply says she was scared by his face. So clearly, Lori had the hots for Joe, OK? And she had to take out that. I think what she was doing, really, I think it's very interesting, is that Louisa May Alcott wrote a lot of sensation stories. Right? I don't know if anybody's ever read any of those. Yeah, like Behind a Mask is probably the most well-known one, A Whisper in the Dark. 
and they're um, they're full of sex and intrigue and drugs and passion and all these things, right? And so this was the first time that she, she published those under a pseudonym. She didn't want Emerson or her father to know <laughs> <laughs> to know about these stories, right? Because they were very improper. Um, but she made good money from them, and she had fun writing them. And just like Joe in the book, right? Uh, so it wasn't discovered until the mid-20th century that Louisa had actually published such stories, like Joe in the book, and they were discovered. They were published under pseudonym. And um, anyway, they're very interesting. But I think what she's doing with Little Women is she's adapting her style for a younger audience and realizing, oh, I probably shouldn't have Lori grab her and kiss her violently, so I'll take that out. Little things like that. It's very interesting, very interesting. OK, we can talk more about that later if you want. But I will get on with my talk. Um, thank you all for coming out in this beautiful snowstorm. I live in New Orleans, and I haven't seen snow like this in ages. Uh, I grew up in, in Minnesota, though, so I, I know what it's like. Um, but I, I have to say I miss it. Maybe I've gotten a little romantic about it, sort of idealizing it. But um, it's very lovely out there tonight. Um, so we're going to talk about the different adaptations. This is based on one of the chapters in my book. Um, but I cover a lot of territory in this book, and I'm happy during the Q&A to talk about any aspect um, of the book or the films. So uh, Little Women was translated, has been translated, into over 50 languages. And it has been adapted for the big and little screen and for radio all over the world. This was something I didn't realize when I started my research was what a beloved book it was all over the country, all over the world. In fact, my book has been translated into Spanish, and I've been getting interview requests from newspapers in um, Brazil and Spain and Argentina and different places, um, Venezuela. So there's, you know, there's a lot of interest in Little Women all over the world, and um, <clears throat> some of these. Um, We'll look at a couple of, of examples of adaptations in other parts of the world, but um, these adaptations that have been done. Are they, adaptations are really interesting phenomena, right? Because they're not the book. They can't duplicate the experience of reading, that immersive experience of reading the book. Every adaptation has to pick and choose which parts of the story it's going to highlight. Little Women is a big, big book. Yeah, it's, it's really two books, right? Not only did she write it in two parts, but there's a three-year gap in between the two stories. And the second book really takes us off, you know, to Europe, to New York, you know, we're all over the place. And it's, it, we're watching these girls grow up. They're all growing up in different directions, in different ways. And it's a very complicated book. It's a complicated story. There are many... Um, little tangents, things that happen here and there. It's a very episodic book. We see lots of things happen to the girls. So when that comes time to adapt the book, we really have to think of them as interpretations, right? What do they see as valuable or important at a particular time to represent in this particular format for a particular audience? <clears throat> and I know for those of us who love the book, it can be very hard sometimes to watch adaptations, right? Because you notice not only what, what they've taken from the book, but what they've left out, right? Some of your favorite parts, maybe they don't get in, or things they add to these adaptations. And when I started writing this book, I realized I just had to let all of that go, right? I just had to observe them as their own sort of unique experiences that are, you know, sometimes very loosely based on the books and sometimes more closely. But we'll talk about some differences here. But I wanted to start, actually, with some of the plays. I'm mostly going to talk about the films, but I wanted to go ahead. This is the very first adaptation of Little Women. It is from the 1912 Broadway play. And when that play was made, uh, Alcott descendants were still alive. Her nephew, who was Anna's son, John Pratt, who had been renamed John Pratt Alcott so that he could inherit Louisa's copyrights. Okay, she was his heir. And um, so the copyrights stayed in the family. He was in control of her estate. And these Broadway people wanted to make a, a play about the story of their family, right? They really thought of the of Little Women as the story of their family, and they thought of it as a story that was too intimate to be put 
onto a stage, the public, you know, this sort of garish light of the Broadway stage. They worried about, and in fact, a lot of people, were, people who loved the book were very concerned. I had some interesting quotes in here from people who thought, you know, what are they going to do with our story, our beloved story that we've cried over, that we've, you know, read many, many times? Um, or do they respect it in the same way that we do, right? Because Broadway was full of lots of crazy plays, okay? Uh, you know, lots of hijinks and dramatic, you know, over-dramatized, you know, melodrama and stuff. So um, they had to be very careful. And it took, it took Jesse, um, Jesse Bunstell quite a while to convince John Pratt Alcott and his brother and their cousin, who was May's daughter, whose name was Lulu, named after Louisa. She was still living, too, to convince them that you know they would allow this um, play to be made, and they were in the audience the very first night, and they loved it. Everybody loved it. <laughs> it was a very, uh, very respectful, very faithful adaptation, very different from other plays at the time, and it was extremely popular. Um, and it, you can't, of course, you know, you can't see it now, but there, the script is still in you know, available. You can find it in libraries. There have been different editions of it printed over time. So you can see, um, you can read the script. And it's, it is a fairly faithful adaptation, but it really focuses on the girls getting married. Joe barely writes at all. Amy, I don't even think, looks at a paintbrush. And, <laughs> right? And it's really about, you know, oh, Christmas isn't Christmas without any presents. That's how it opens, like the book. Apparently audiences cheered when they first heard that because they knew this was the real thing, you know, just like the book. And um, it starts with you know, a lot of the family stories from the beginning of the book, and next thing you know, you know, they're off and all getting married. Um, yeah. <laughs> As I said, Little Women's a big book. You gotta pick and choose, and this is what a lot of the adaptations chose to focus on. We can talk more about that. The, um, there was another important Broadway production more recently, but this is the 2004 Broadway musical. Um, it starred Sutton Foster, who'd won a Tony the previous year. It did not do particularly well, and it is a rather, um, it, it takes some liberties, it focuses more on Joe as a writer. There's very little um, development of the other characters. It really focuses on Joe. But you could, if you look online, there are, def there are different productions of it that you can watch on YouTube. The reason there are so many of these YouTube videos of different productions is because this play is still performed very widely all over the country in community and high school theaters. Um, this production, probably has more legs than any other production because it has been performed for so many years all over the country. And so so many, um, so many young people have known the book, especially since the 94 film, right? That was 25 years ago. We've had a long gap. But in the meantime, they've seen it at high school, right? Or they were in the play or something. So a lot of young people have known the story through this, through this particular production. Another interesting stage adaptation <clears throat> is an opera. There was, Mark Adama wrote an opera in 1998, it premiered. It was performed on PBS in their Great Performances series in 2001, so you can see that performance on a video. Um, and I'll have more to say about that later because that one is actually, until the recent movie, my favorite of the adaptations, which I can talk about more. But both the... Um, both the opera and the recent Broadway play really start changing up the story, okay? Kind of anticipating Greta Gerwig a little bit, which we can, we can talk about when we get to that. Um, but these are the major stage adaptations, okay? But on television, so we're getting closer to, to films, on television, I mean, I can't even count. I mean, it's, you know, I tried to include an accounting here in my book, but I'm sure I missed some because there have been so many all over the world. It's been, um, we know it's been on television at least four times in the U.S. The most significant was an NBC miniseries in 1978 that starred Susan Day, if you remember her, from the 70s. But <laughs> does anybody, does anybody know about this? You won't even believe who played Professor Bear. William Shatner, Star Trek fame. <laughs> It's really interesting for that alone, right? 
With the, the, I can't remember the actress's name who played Jan Brady. She was Beth. Anyway, it has a very Little House on the Prairie vibe to it. And they tried to capture that audience, but it never was very successful, like A Little House on the Prairie. Um, but it is, it's a mini series. So when you start getting into you know, longer adaptations, they can include a lot more stuff in it. So there's some interesting stuff about Meg um, after she gets married that never gets in the films, right? <clears throat> so it, it has some, I, I talk about it in more, in more length in my book, but there's some interesting aspects to it. The, in the UK, the BBC has actually adapted it five times. Most recently last year, and I'll get to that one in a little bit. I do have a couple things to, more to say about that. It's also been adapted in places like Mexico, Turkey, Italy, Japan, all in television. Um, there was a Turkish series that ran 120 episodes. I couldn't get my hands on that, and I wouldn't have understood it anyway, but that's <laughs> what I hear. Um, more, even more influentially, and this, this is a series actually, the, the Japanese anime, there's on the left, is, is a shot from the Japanese anime version. There have been a couple of different Jan Japanese anime ones. This one, I think, is the one that ran 86 episodes. Yeah, they're eating popsicles. <laughs> <laughs> there are three different Japanese anime. There's like a film, and then there's a short series, and then there's this really long one, 86 episodes. It actually starts, they're living near Gettysburg, and the Civil War is going on, and the, and the army like occupies their home. It's crazy stuff. Yeah, it's, you know, it's America. We got to get more war stuff in here, right? Louisa didn't do enough of the war, so they're interested in that. But it's, and then it, they eventually go live with Aunt March because, you know, their home's been taken over by the Confederates. And that's when things start to get more like the book. But it's interesting. And this series was run in America on HBO in English for many years. And it was also dubbed into many different languages and shown in other places in the world. So a lot of young people know Little Women actually through, through this series, if you can believe it. The one on the right um, is a, a web series that is from India. It's in Hindi. I don't know what Hakse means. I've looked it up. And it apparently has many translations, so I wouldn't try to translate it. Um, you can see. I haven't looked recently to see, but they, they said they were going to eventually provide English subtitles. But if you watch the, um, <clears throat> the trailer, they break into English every once in a while. And I think uh, it's, it's set in Kashmir. It, it looks absolutely fascinating. So Joe is, you know, this is a modernized version set in a, in a very perilous region. And Joe is a young writer who's writing stuff that gets her in trouble. And she's, you know, people are coming after her family. And anyway, because she's not being a traditional woman. I mean, this is, <laughs> these adaptations really give you a sense of what legs this story has all over the world, right? These are, you know, when you have these four sisters who take, who have such different approaches to growing up, growing into a woman, um, they're really almost having, you know, debates about what kind of women they will be, what possibilities there are for them. And these are questions that, you know, even more in other parts of the country are still deeply difficult, right? Um, I mean, it's still hard to grow up female in this country, and I do talk about that in my book, but in other parts of the world it's even harder. I don't know if anybody heard there was a really interesting story on This American Life that ran a couple of months ago, a young girl, she, she was from Pakistan. And she had come to America when she was young, but her parents took her back. It's a complicated story, but anyway, she's back in Pakistan. And she's being forced to, um, you know, renounce every Western thing in her life and be very, very traditional. And she has a copy of Little Women that she hides under her bed and reads. And it means so much to her. Anyway, she did, she did come back to America. <clears throat> it's a very powerful story, but that's just an indication of what the story has meant in other parts of the world. Okay, now to the films. All right. There were two silent films that were made not long after the Broadway play, and they were, the one that was made in America by William Brady was based on the 1912 Broadway play, using more or less the same script. And this is, the, both of these silent films were lost. One of them was made in England, one in the US. So we don't have the films, but we know the one in America was based on the play here. And this is a really interesting ad that I found um, from Moving Picture World. So an industry magazine from January 1919. I'll just read to you what it says. How much influence have women upon your box office? 
because I, I thought this is really interesting in light of some recent discussions about whether men will go see, yeah, this is 1919. How much influence have women upon your box office? If you don't please the women, young and old, you don't prosper, right? Louisa M. Alcott's novel, Little Women, is the story that has been read by more women than any book ever published. When William A. Brady made it into play, it was a tremendous success. If it played in your city, you know that. Now it is a moving picture. Its appeal to women drew big business to the Strand Theater in New York City in the midst of the influenza epidemic, 1918. Yeah. So here you see the, the pitch that they're making, how they're positioning the film. It's a, it's a film for women. Right, and women are an important part of the box office, and you want to draw them out, right, and appeal to them. I thought that was very interesting, and we can talk more about um, the gender of the audiences when we get to, because that's never really been talked about before until this more recent one. 1933, uh, during the Great Depression, Catherine Hepburn as Joe, right? Um, this is a really interesting adaptation because given the setting of the Great Depression, you see a bit more emphasis on the poverty of the family. If you saw the recent adaptation, a lot of people have been telling me they didn't look very poor, right? Um, but this, this movie really does emphasize it a bit more. Um, the girls, their dresses, the cuffs were like sandpapered so that they would be kind of frayed and ragged. Um, there's a scene that opens as the film the scene that opens the film that references the Civil War and uh, the poverty of the family, the scene where they go visit and they give away their breakfast to the Hummels is given quite a bit of time, right? Whereas that, that wasn't mentioned in, in some later films, or at least in the, in the 49. But like most adaptations, this one emphasized the romance. So, and if you look at the poster, can you sort of see the arch, right? It's Joe and Professor Bear with the umbrella. Under the umbrella, yeah, yeah. And we'll we'll see this theme repeated in some, but but um, it, it Catherine Hepburn, and I don't want to step on any toes here because I know a lot of people love Catherine Hepburn as Joe, right? Um, Catherine Hepburn thought she was Joe, right? <laughs> she grew up when she was a little girl. She she cut off her hair and wore pants and called herself Jimmy. Yeah, she wanted to be a boy growing up. So she really identified with Joe. And um, she plays the tomboy to the hilt, right? She's very, you know, there's a fencing scene where she's, you know, different things that were added that she's, you know, she really plays it up. It's 1933 acting style, right? So it's a bit, feels a bit over the top to us. But um, there are also other parts of the film. I mean, you wouldn't know this was Little Women looking at it, would you? That that was Joe. I mean, look at the way she's, that's Lori, and she's holding the kittens, the way she's looking at him very invitingly. And then also the scene there with, with Professor Bear on the right. So what happens to Catherine Hepburn in this film, and it's something you see in most of the films, is that Joe transforms from a, you know, kind of rough and tumble girl into suddenly this, oh, you know, she's sort of swooning over the Professor Bear, and her voice gets very high. Right? It was earlier Catherine Hepburn's, you know, she's <laughs> talking like this, and, you know, and now suddenly she's, oh, Professor Bear. And, you know, neither one of those versions is a Joe. Joe is not performing. She's just Joe. Right? She just happens to be a girl who's not particularly crazy about being a girl. Um, they, there's a tendency to, I think, overplay the tomboyish part to the detriment of the more sort of nurturing feminine aspects of Joe. And the way she looks after Beth, she's very maternal with Beth, right? And so Joe's a complex character. And I think she's been, you know, the, 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 the split that you often see in the films. From, Joe being this, you know, rough and tumble boy to being this, you know, you know, batting her eyelashes at Professor Bear. I mean, that's just, yeah. <laughs> it's just wrong. Yes, just wrong. So this is just another slide showing all the girls. And this is the best one I could get to kind of show. I have a better picture in my book, actually. Um, Joan Bennett on the left there, she's playing Amy, right? And... Amy's a difficult character to capture on film. This is one of the biggest problems that people have adapting this movie. She's 12 when the movie starts, when the 
book starts. By the end, what is she, 19, or she's even older at the end, but uh, she marries Lori, right? She has to make a tremendous transformation. So how do, you, how do you cast her? What do you do with her? Well, here's Joan Bennett trying to look like a little girl. She's 23 years old and she's pregnant, okay? <laughs> Can you kind of tell that her dress is getting really big and they're trying to put her behind stuff so you can't see? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, when we get to the 1994 film, oops, I went the wrong direction. Or, I'm sorry, the 1949, <laughs> transpose my numbers there. Um, yeah, we, well, first of all, we have the stressing of the love story again, world's greatest love story. Is that how we think of little women? No. No, no it's a coming of age story. It's about four girls growing up. It's not a, it's not a romance. Um, but, you know, even when the book was first published, right, it was published in those two parts. So the first book was Little Women. And then when the second book was published, there was this question of what to call it. Um, Alcott didn't like what one of her friends suggested. She suggested they call it Wedding Marches. So were all the girls were pairing off, yeah. <laughs> so they just called it Little Women Part Two. And when it was published in England, though, do we have any people from England or Ireland? Or what's it called over there, the second part of Little Women? You don't know. Um, to this day, it is still published in two parts. And the second book has a different title. It's called Good Wives. Oh, my God, yeah. Good Wives. It was given many different titles by different publishers because there was no international copyright law, and all these publishers were pirating it, publishing different versions. Um, it had different titles, Nice Wives, Little Wives, a lot of wives. Apparently, Good Wives stuck. If you walk into a Waterstones bookstore in England today, you will see Little Women and Good Wives on the shelf. And I've met many British women. In fact, I met one earlier today in Boston who told me, they never read Good Wives. They just read Little Women. Because why would they want to read a book called Good Wives? <laughs> right? Why would any girl pick up a book called Good Wives? So their idea of Little Women is very different. Our idea of Little Women is, you know, we have to deal with that second half of the book when Joe gets married. We'll talk more about that. <laughs> because obviously with the Greta Gerwig film, this becomes a big issue. Um, Yes, but look at, all, look at all these March sisters. I mean, they're just Hollywood bells, you know, right? Um, this is the Technicolor version. It is basically a remake of the 1933 film in color. They were so enamored with color. We need a little women in color now. And um, you can kind of tell here, they all have wearing lots of makeup. Um, the colors were too much. And it really, you see this in some of the other scenes where the Meg and Amy in particular are wearing lots of bright pink and yellows and you know, they're really, you know, this ultra feminine ideal that we see emerge after World War II, right? It's very much of its time, 1949. And the girls are really dolled up. In fact, that on the right is Elizabeth Taylor playing Amy. She looks like a Madame Alexander doll. So the problem we have <coughs> She, uh, she, yeah, this was her last child role, but she was 18. And I don't know if you notice who that is in the bottom. That is Margaret O'Brien playing Beth. I can't remember her age. She's like 15, maybe 12. She's still very young. So how, what's going on here? Yeah, what they did to solve this problem of what did we do with Amy growing up is they made Beth the youngest daughter the youngest sister, because she doesn't have to grow up, does she? Because she dies. So we get to see, you know, Amy being Amy and being obnoxious as Elizabeth Taylor, <laughs> as, you know, as sort of an older girl, because she's the third girl. It's a, it's a kind of creative thing to do. It's taking some artistic license. I'm not, I'm not opposed to it. I think it kind of works because it's a real problem that the other films have not solved very well. Um, okay, what else can I say about the 1949 film? The next slide shows you a scene they added to the movie where the girls go shopping. 
So this is post-World War II, right? What is happening in the world? First of all, there's really no mention of civil war. We don't want to talk about war. We don't want to deal with poverty. We know those, those themes, you know, come out of the adaptation, and instead we have the girls go on a shopping spree before Christmas with money that Aunt March has given them, can you imagine? Um, <laughs> <laughs> right? She's given them money to just go spend on Christmas presents. And they all dutifully buy the end. They're all looking at things that they want to buy in the store. And by the end, they decide to buy Marmy gifts instead of for themselves. So that's kind of in line with the, you know, the themes of self, theme of self-sacrifice in Little Women. But this whole scene is very much of its time because what's happening is the whole economy is shifting from a wartime economy to a consumer economy. We need to get those women in the stores and they need to be buying dishwashers and furnishing their homes and you know all of that. And so it really kind of, I think, you know, this is not a scene in the book. It is completely made for the film, for the times. Um, so in the, in the ultra feminine roles that we see the girls playing and in this shopping scene, we, it's very much of its time. Um, critics did not like this movie. They liked the 33 film a lot. They liked the Broadway play, the silent films. <clears throat> but this film went too far. It was, um, it was over the top in the colors and in the emotions. Uh, there's, a, there's a really interesting review that says if you, if you wash away the garish colors and the overwrought emotions, right? Then maybe you'll find the story of little women. It was just a, it was, it was a, you know, a little bit too uh, Wizard of Oz, you know, with the colors and everything. And it just didn't feel like the, the intimate story, right? It was too Hollywood. It was too big, too pretty. Um, so I thought that was very interesting because then what happens when they make the '94 film is they tone the color palette drains and it's very warm colors, very subdued, very creating this whole sort of nostalgic glow around, around little women. <clears throat> so I'm sure many of you know this film, right? The 94 film. This is the movie that, you know, that I fell in love with when I was younger and I loved. I've seen it many, many times. We own a DVD at home. And, um, I have a lot of nostalgia for this film. This film evokes a lot of nostalgia, I think. This is 1994. This is the era of intact families, right? I grew up at this time. Most of us had parents, you know, who were divorced or we had step families, right? And this was a movie that was offering a kind of very uh, sort of snow globey, you know, romantic idea, right, of what families were like when they would gather around the piano and make pies together or what have you, right? It, it evoked those kind of feelings about family. Um, the 19, as a result, I think, we see a real stress on this being a family film. That's how it was marketed. <clears throat> when... Um, when it came time to make this film, it was really hard to convince the male Sony executives uh, to make Little Women. The producer, Amy Pascal, took her 12 years to get this film made. And interestingly, her name is actually Amy Beth Pascal. She's named after two of the Little Women. And she is the producer behind the new Greta Gerwig film as well. Yes. And uh, another producer, Denise DeNovi from 94, is also on this project. The screenwriter, Robin Swicord, who wrote the 94 film, is also a producer on this new film. So there was clearly an understanding that we needed, you know, a new Little Women for a new generation. And this one is really of its time. What we have, I think, evidenced in the film, but also in the discussion around the film. If you look at how, you know, the interviews with the director at the time, how it was marketed, how it was reviewed, there's this kind of clash between, you know, this feminist version of Little Women and the family values, right, which were, which were very prominent at that time. Greta, um, Gillian Anderson, who was the director then, she did not want people calling it a feminist film because by 1994, this is, you know, we're, we're well into the backlash against feminism. A lot of negative connotations were associated with feminism. It's really only recently, I think, that the term is starting to be rehabilitated again. <clears throat> so they were downplaying that. But at the same time, Robin Swicord wrote a film that completely rewrote the story. She didn't take any dialogue from the book. Previous adaptations borrowed lots of you know language from the book. This one, she said that she rewrote it 
um, as if Louise May Alcott was alive today, what would she, what story would she feel free to write now? So you have scenes where Marmy is, you know, complaining about corsets, you know, how they restrict women. <coughs> Other things that she doesn't say in the book, like she she rails against the sexual double standard, um, different things that you know, uh, Joe talks about women's right to vote. I mean, none of that's in the book, and that's fine, you know, because um, these were ideas that Alcott believed in, even if she we didn't feel free to put them in the book at the time. But but my concern is that there's so many progressive elements in the book that she could have taken out. And, and that's what Greta Gerwig has done. She went back to the book. All the, almost all the dialogue is either from the book, from Louisa May Alcott's letters. Um, there's a great thing that she steals from a little bit later book, Rose and Bloom, 1876. But mostly it's, you know, those lines that jump out at us or we think, you know, Amy stands up and says, um, I want to be great or nothing. You don't want to be great artist or not at all. That's really in the book. And, and different other, other things, too. But this film, <coughs> in rewriting it, gave us a very different Joe, for instance. This is Winona Ryder as Joe. She's so pretty. She's beautiful. Winona Ryder is just gorgeous, but she's, Joe's not gorgeous. Um, Catherine Hepburn, I also think, was too beautiful to play Joe. But she, um, she never says the line... Um, where she says in the book, um, I always wanted to be a boy, go off to war, right? That is one of the most important parts of Joe's character, and she never says it because Gillian Anderson thought she resented the fact that ambitious, talented girls were portrayed as mannish or too masculine, right? So this is, this is what women were feeling at that particular time, right? Trying to claim their femininity at the same time that they're claiming the right to be independent. So they downplay... Um, Winona Ryder is not a tomboy in the movie really at all. And the only time she's boyish is when she's in drag, when she's in the play <laughs> and she's got the mustache on and she starts speaking in a you know, very low voice in the British accent or something. I, that wasn't British, that's not Spanish. I don't know. She, <laughs> she starts you know, speaking in a different accent and she starts uh, speaking in a very affected way. And it's not at all, you know, there's... You know, we've, we've gotten too far away from the tomboy aspects of Joe. It's very interesting, I think, for the time. And um, Meg, the emphasis is placed on her pre-marriage days, right, going to Vanity Fair, which is a very important aspect of Mo Meg's character, but after she gets married and she has a couple of twins, she just kind of disappears into the background, right? Meg gets married halfway through the book, and we've never seen the difficulty she has adapting, you know, how she keeps growing and the struggles she still has, um, really until the Greta Gerwig film, we, see, we do see some of that. Okay, so how do we solve the problem of Amy in the 1984 film? We get two actresses. So Kirsten Dunst was an amazing Amy. Uh, she really was, I think, about 12 years old. She's perfect. She steals the show. So that when Samantha Mathis suddenly appears on the screen halfway through the film, we're like, huh? Who's this? <laughs> She's very prim and proper. She's a completely different person. There's no continuity between the character of the, that Kirsten Dunst played and the one that Samantha Mathis plays. So beyond the jarring you know, skip with that different actress, we have very different character. Disaster, in my mind. Just does not work. Um, but I get that that's one of the most difficult things to do when you're adapting this film. So this is the um, BBC Masterpiece adaptation. Did anyone see this one when it came out? It came out um, on PBS in April, I think, of 2018. And too early for me to really write about in my book. <clears throat> I think in the paperback edition I was able to add like a, a little paragraph about it. Um, it remained very true to the original. It's a bit longer. It's three hours instead of two. So they're able to get a bit more in. There are parts, um, inc they included parts that were never put on screen before, including the very important passage when Marmy tells Joe, I'm angry nearly every day of my life. Right? 
It is so important because it shows us that Marmee's a human being. She's not perfect. If you go back and watch the 94 film, there are no cracks in Susan Sarandon's facade. She is all-knowing. She's guiding the girls. She knows everything. And uh, she can do no wrong. Or there's just, she's not a human being. She's some kind of saint. But that's not Marmee. Marmee had did her own difficulties, and she shows them to us at different points in the book. When we're young and we read the book, we don't really notice Marmee, right? So if you read it again as an adult, you really start to notice the, you know, the little moments, like when the telegram comes that Mr. March is, um, is sick in Washington and she has to go to him, she says, girls, help me get through this. She asks them for help. Right? This is not the Susan Sarandon saintly version. This is, you know, she's showing the girls that she's a real human being here. And Emily Watson is the best Marmy ever. She's incredible in this role. They give her the character a depth that she's never had on screen before. We see a little bit of it in Laura Dern in the Greta Gerwig, but not as much. Yeah, so it's just Emily it's Watson. I'm sorry, but. Yeah, <laughs> Emily Watson's the real deal. There are other problems with this adaptation. I have actually, I wrote two blog posts about it on my blog, <laughs> if you want to read all my thoughts about it uh, when it came out. So here we get to, yes, the 2019 film, uh, Greta Gerwig, as I said, returned to Alcott's language, and I love the tagline of this film. She calls it, Own Your Story. Yeah, own your story, which is a very, I think, very now sort of message for girls to hear. This is very 2019, because she's telling girls about the importance of women's stories. And this is something that Hollywood has been talking a lot about in the last few years, right? Something she has been talking about, and she's been living through as someone who's been in Hollywood and struggling to, to make her way as a director. And... Um, the fact that Joe is a writer is the, really foregrounded in this movie. And the romances, um, well, if you look at the ending of the film, right, what happens? Does Joe marry Professor Bear? How many of you have seen it? I don't want to give anything away. Oh, most of you have seen it. Great. <laughs> right. So do you think she marries Professor Bear in the end? We seem uncertain. And I think Greta Gerwig wants us to be uncertain, right? She's given us two endings, right? We have Joe writing her book and telling, uh, telling the publisher that, you know, Joe didn't get married and he wants her to get married. She says, okay, fine, we'll get her married. And so the next scene we see Joe getting, you know, at Plumfield. And so is that a scene in the, from the book? Is that what really happened, right? It's very meta, right? We're talking about writing this story. And if you look at trailers from the film, it actually starts with the scene where the publisher is telling Joe sitting across from him at the desk, well, and if his story is about a girl, make sure she gets married in the end or dies, right? <laughs> And Greta Gerwig has said, we still don't know how to tell women's stories. We have a difficult time taking women's lives, the complexity of them, and capturing them in a story for a book or for a film because of this imperative to end with marriage. Now, Louisa did feel that when she was writing the book. So right, it was published in two parts. So the first part ends with Meg engaged um, Mr. March has come back from war, Beth has gotten better, the curtains close, right, everything's fine. And uh, the girls, it was so popular, girls started writing letters to Louisa to find out what happens to the March sisters. They specifically wanted to know, who did they marry? And Louisa grumbled in her journal as if that were the only end and aim of a woman's life, right? She wanted Joe to remain, in her words, a literary spinster. And... If she couldn't do that, because obviously that wasn't going to fly, these girls were clamoring for marriages. They, that, was, that was the ending of the story to them. That was, what, that was all that you needed to know, right, is who they end up with. And that's how all stories with girls pretty much ended, death or marriage. 
<clears throat> so first of all, she has Meg get married right off the bat in the second book. So her story doesn't end with marriage. So we see her growing and changing. And again, girls don't pay any attention to that the first time they read the book. But if you read it when you're older, you'll see she's really struggling. I love the current jelly scene. If you haven't read the book recently, you don't remember what I'm talking about, go back and read the chapter where she tries to make current jelly and it's a disaster. Yes. That's never been on film. I'd like to see that on film. Um, but anyway, they uh, so so she had to give, she had to marry Joe. But she said, "I won't marry Joe to Lori to please anyone. I'm going to instead give her a funny match." She said. She married her to Professor Bear. <coughs> so by marrying her to Professor Bear, she's kind of poking at her readers a little bit. She's not giving them what they want. They clearly want her to marry Lori. They have this very romantic idea right, of Joe, you know, riding off into the sunset with Lori, and she punctures that by giving her this stodgy old professor to marry, and the most unromantic proposal scene ever under the umbrella. It's actually really sweet, but it's not Hollywood romance sort of thing, right? And so what Greta Gerwig does is she gives us the Hollywood romance ending with Joe and Professor Bear under the umbrella. In fact, if you'll notice, she cuts and we see it from a different angle. It has this very Hollywoody sort of, you know, rom-com kind of feel to it. And the next thing we know, she's sitting in the publisher's office talking about how to end her book. So funny. It's really, really interesting. I love what she did with this. That's what Professor Bear's cast is this girl Oh, yeah. She's really like, wasn't. yeah, we're going to give her the rom-com guy, too, yeah, right? Yeah. If we're going give to give her the rom-com ending. Yeah. So it's, what she has done is she's taken this imperative, this box that women's stories have been put into and just cracked it open and shown us what if the story ended how Louisa really wanted to end it? What if we told a different narrative about women's lives, right? What would that look like? And so it's actually a very, I think, moving ending. And <clears throat> if she said, too, that she, in portraying Joe and creating the character of Joe, she's woven together elements of Louisa, right? She's taken things that Louisa says in her letters, like when she says um, to Meg, I'd rather be a spinster and paddle my own canoe, those are Louisa's words from her journal. And so she's kind of woven the two together. And I think what she's doing at the end of the movie is she unravels them. And Joe, the character, goes off and marries Professor Bear and starts Plumfield. Louisa writes her book, right, and has the negotiations with the publisher and is wearing a little bowler hat and she's a nice little touch. But let me, I just wanted to show you a couple of images here Contrasting. Well, see, that's actually that uh, that red cover is a sort of facsimile. It's somewhat like the first edition of the book of Little Women, which they did a really nice job with that scene where it's being published. Just beautiful. So this is the classic image of uh, Marmee and the girls reading Mr. March's letter that you've seen in Little Women illustrations from the very beginning. And this is usually the frontispiece. And then the, each of the movies has an image like this for promotional purposes, too. And if you just, um, I think if you compare these two pictures, it gives us a sense of the different tone of the two movies. The 99, 94 film, there's this very sort of wistful look on their faces, right? And in the, in the other one, their faces look very different, much more serious. I think this is a much more serious film in tone than the 94 film. Uh, because it starts with them as adults, and they're off all on their four different paths in life, uh, we see them looking back on their childhood and realizing how much has changed, the difficulties of the decisions they made. I couldn't get a picture of this online, but that first image of Meg, Emma Watson as Meg in the movie at the very beginning, she's sitting framed in the, you're sitting in the, on the doorstep framed by the door, and she just looks so downtrodden, right? Meg's a mother of two twins, and uh, they're very poor. As we learn, she's really struggling with not having any money to buy nice things. And that's not been on film before. That's good to see. But that look that she has there, it reminds me of that Dorothea Lange photograph from the Great Depression. I don't know if Greta Gerwig had that in mind. I know she was... <coughs> I know she drew a lot of inspiration from 19th century art, but that is actually very similar. Yeah. This, yeah, because I think what she's trying to show us 
is, you know, the choices that Meg made were difficult. And even though she loves John, right, it's hard to be a mother of little kids. It's hard to be poor. And she's not sugarcoating that for us, right? Um, <clears throat> I think I had another. Oh, yes, I have Amy here, too. Well, oh, this is just a picture of the three girls as adults, right? Beth has already died. But look at the serious looks on their faces, too, right? These are women. Well, let me just stop there. These are women, right? These aren't girls. These aren't little women. These are women who are looking back on their lives and have been through a lot. And this is actually the scene where Joe's talking about writing her story. And she says, um, you know, it's just a little tale of our lives. It's nothing important. And Amy's the one who tells her, by writing about it, you make it important. These were lines that Greta Gerwig added to the film, but they're really beautiful. Um, she, um, she said in a, in a piece that she wrote for Vanity Fair, just a few days before the Oscars were announced, the nominations, she said um, uh, that Louisa May Alcott made women's stories, the stories of women's lives, important enough to be literature, right? She gave them a certain status, a certain respect. Um, and that's a tremendous accomplishment. But she said there's still a hierarchy of stories. And the top of the hierarchy is male stories about violence, men on men, men on women. And then two days later, the nominations came out. Uh, the top three movies with the most nominations were Joker, 11, 1917 had 10, that's the World War I movie. Um, the Irishman, the Martin Scorsese, had 10. I think Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, also pretty violent, had 10. Little Women had six. And as I'm sure you noticed, she wasn't nominated for Best Director. So when the movie came out, before the movie came out, they were doing advanced screenings, and they were inviting Academy voters to the, the screenings, and there weren't any men in the audience. And they started getting worried because 68% of Academy voters are white men, and they weren't coming to see the film. And so they started a bit of a campaign. Tracy Letts wrote a really cute little piece for GQ about, he's the one who plays the publisher, about what, um, what an honor it was to support the women in making this film. It's really beautiful. And then there's this great GQ picture of all of the male cast, you know, looking very dapper. And it's, you should look it up. It's really cute. Um, but there's been so much discussion. There's never been talk about this before. None of the other adaptations... Um, you know, they had a hard time getting them made. They had a hard time getting, convincing a male Broadway producer to put on the 1912 play. They had a hard time getting Sony to make the 1994 film. This time around, Amy Pascal, she is one of the top executives at Sony, and they got a bigger budget than they've ever had before, right? And they got this amazing young director to make it who has been nominated before, but it's still hard right, to convince people that this is an important enough story that everybody should be interested in it, right? And there's been a lot of discussion. Uh, I actually have a whole chapter in my book called Can Boys Read Little Women? <laughs> and because I discovered in my research that little women isn't taught in schools anymore, and teachers were telling me, this is a quote from one of them, it's really a private book for girls, not suitable for the public classroom. Now, the idea behind that is the same idea why men wouldn't go see the film. A woman, when I was at Fruitlands two nights ago in the Q&A, raised her hand and told me um, she hadn't seen the movie yet. She's been wanting to see it. And uh, her son has been in town. You know, he's on break from college. And he said he'd go see a movie with her. She's all excited, right? They get in the car. And on the way to the theater, he says, what are we seeing? And she says, little women. And he says, uh-uh, I can't go to that. I can't go to that. So I was like, what did you do? She said, we turned around and went home. I know. Yeah. But then earlier today in Boston, I had other women telling me that they took their sons and their husbands, right, and they enjoyed it and had lots of discussions afterwards. So it's not, you know, it's not everybody, but there is a large element out there that feels that a story about girls would be embarrassing, right? There's so much taint to it and so much shame attached to it. And I have a lot of, uh, a lot of good quotes from uh, men who've read the book. John Green, the, um, the YA author, 
He's a big Little Women fan. He loves Louisa May Alcott, and he never understood why it was considered just for girls, which is really cool. That has unfortunately not been the, the prevalent view. I just wanted to read one little thing. See, I talk too long. I can go on and on and on. You just bear with me for one more. <laughs> well, one more thing I wanted to read, because this is something I wrote. So, of course, my book came out uh, in 2018, long bef before the movie was even made, okay? But uh, this is what I said about the, the opera. The opera by Marco Adamo, I think, was the most successful adaptation of Little Women. I said, the story Adamo tells does exactly what an adaptation should do. It opens up the original text and makes you feel like you understand it even more deeply. It's not only a work of art in its own right, but it's also in deep conversation with the original, as if the two are distinct entities existing side by side, each enriching the other. The opera makes you want to go back and read Alcott's work, not to compare or check for points of dissimilarity, but to reread it with fresh eyes, right? So he tells a new story out of Little Women. I think that's what Greta Gerwig has done. She has created something that really is a work of art in its own right. Um, so I've been to see it three times. I'm hoping to go see it again <laughs> very soon because there's, you know, even if you know the book so well, right, you don't know what's coming next, right, because of how she has, yeah, she's rewoven the threads that make up the story and woven them together in a new way. It's really beautiful. But thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. I don't know if anybody has to dash off. Okay. <laughs> And before I forget, I have a newsletter that I, uh, I write profiles of lesser known women writers. So in addition to my news, and I include lots of little women stuff, I also profile women writers that you may be interested in learning about. So I thought I would pass around the sign-up sheet if anybody wants to sign up for that. Yes. I, I love myself, um, but I was a little bit confused by you going back mm -hmm. and you're so much. Yeah. I was what you thought about that and if... Oh yeah, I would have done a lot of things differently, sure. I, the first time I saw it, I just sat there like this, you know, taking it all in and noticing, you know, oh, they're cool, they're saying that, which they've never said before, but oh, she cuts it off too early, they don't keep going and say the other cool thing. You know, so it's, it, it was hard, it's, you know, I didn't, I'm not a filmmaker, this is her film. Um, I think what she's accomplished is so tremendous. I mean, I met little girls earlier today in Boston who loved the movie and then came out to see me and hear me talk about it, and now they're going to go read Little Women, right? That's what I was hoping would happen, because girls aren't reading Little Women anymore. If she can make young women think this is a story that matters and that stories about girls matter, right? Just the ordinary, everyday, you know, getting through life and growing up, and that the, what girls went through in 150 years ago is what girls are still going through now. If we can relate to these characters across time, I think she's accomplished something very tremendous. So I do have quibbles, but, you know, it's too big what she's done. I'm just so so thrilled. I think that might help. But yeah, I would have gone back and forth less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, girls have stopped reading it. Well, I have a young daughter, and so I was able to sort of witness this up close and see what's going on. Um, well, she grew up with Harry Potter. And that's what these girls were saying today that I was talking to. Yeah, they did too. And uh, once you read Harry Potter, it's hard to read Little Women. Because books like Harry Potter or the other series that my daughter just fell into, right? Like, like girls used to read Little Women with, you know, over and over and over. And as soon as they got to the end, they'd start over again and they'd act out different things. So that happened with my daughter with Hunger Games. Oh my I know, I was horrified. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, you know, this is a book about teenagers learning to kill each other. And, but I read it, so I had to read it to see, and I thought, you know what? This Katniss Everdeen's a lot like Joe March. She's a provider for her family. She has a young sister she's taking care of, she's looking after, and uh, she has a male friend who wants to be more than friends, and she's trying to negotiate that relationship. There's some interesting similarities. And I started noticing Hermione in, um, in Harry Potter's a lot like, lot like Joe, but the problem is, is that all of these stories start off, you know, they race off on some adventure by like page three. 
And that just doesn't happen in Little Women. It is slow, it's episodic. It's like, a, I tell kids it's like a TV series, right? If you take each chapter as like an episode, think of it that way. So it's, it's character driven, right? It's not really as plot driven. And that's hard for kids. And it's, there are a lot of words, big words, that are not used as much anymore, you know, that's hard, I think, for kids. So it can be difficult, but um, I think if they watch the, the movie, maybe watch the 94 movie, you know, that gives them a kind of entrance into the story, and so they can start to imagine these girls as, as real life people again. Yes? Thank you for your talk. Thank you. You mentioned that you would like to see the Jedi making a scene. Yes. Yeah. So he, yeah, he was asking about. I said I, I love to see the current jelly scene, um, on film. He asked if there were other, other scenes I'd like to see on film. Um. Oh, I love the calls chapter. That's one of my favorite chapters. When um, so in that chapter, I don't think that one's ever been on film, even in like the TV adaptations and things that were like mini series and longer. In that one, um, it's in the second half of the book. Meg, and, or I'm sorry, Joe and Amy. Uh, well, Amy has to go out and they have to go out and make calls to the neighbors, you know, social calls. And um, and Amy dresses Joe up, tries to make her look proper, tells her to be on her best behavior, right? And she just can't do it, you know. She gets out, she starts overdoing it, overplaying it, you know, and embarrassing Amy. And then she, you know, starts, you know, gets mud on her boots and tramps, tramps mud into the house. I mean, it's this very interesting chapter where we really see the difference between the two girls. And by the end, you know, yeah, Joe's really questioning Amy about why she wants to fit in with all these people, you know, that she doesn't really respect. And Amy thinks it's important. And Joe says, well, I, you know, I... I I'm a part of the new and you're a part of the old, right? So Joe is really claiming her reform, you know, sort of personality, wanting things to change for women. And Amy's happy to adapt because she's good at it. And people like her, right? She gets a lot of benefits from it, but we see how Joe doesn't fit. So things like that would be really neat to see the characters fleshed out more. Um, there really is too much emphasis placed on the romances. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, and then... I just wanted to say in, comment, in terms of the, um, the influence that the book has had on other artists and writers and everything, that um, in, um, I haven't really read it all, excuse me, but um, my brilliant friend. Yes, um, Elena, I mentioned that on the first page of my book. Because oh, really? it's, so, it's so amazing that really, if you haven't read the Neapolitan Quartet by Elena Ferrante, these two girls are growing up in uh, 1950s Naples, and they're poor, and they see their mothers and their grandmothers and the lives that they lead, and they're just desperate to find some way out of this. And they get a copy of Little Women, and they read it, and they think, oh, we're going to go out and be writers someday and be famous like Louisa and like Joe. And one of the women ends up following that path and able, is able to pursue it, and the other one gets trapped. She has to get married and have kids, and it's, it's a, but Little Women becomes then the story that they build their lives around, which is really, I think, true. I have a whole uh, section where I talk about all the women writers who've been influenced by Little Women. It's a tremendous number. Okay, you had your hand up in the back. Thanks, yeah, uh, I have a question, but I'll quickly relate on a very amusing anecdote, which is a friend of mine said that she was trying to get people to go see Little Women with her. And she asked uh, some a guy she knew, and the guy said, oh, I don't want to see that. And she goes, oh, you don't want to see a movie about women. He goes, no, I, don't, I want to see an American movie. I don't like those Jane Austen things. <laughs> 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 so I have a feeling that there's a lot of people who think little women is, it, it, they're not opposed to it necessarily on a misogynistic grounds, but they think it's this stuffy thing with petty <laughs> Not even going to American stories. So. That's really interesting. Yeah, and I've I've seen some uh, some men saying, well, what, you know, it's been adapted so many times. You know, who, you know, they are they pro that is probably what they're what they're thinking. They're putting it in that category of sort of the petticoat historical drama. Um, and yeah, little what Greta Gerwig shows us that it's so much more than that. And given given the way that so many critics were saying this is one of the best movies of the year, you would think that would be enough for these film. You know, these these guys who are in film 
you know, this is one of the best movies of the year. Janet Maslin of the New York Times says it's like tied for the best movie of the year. So why wouldn't you go see it? Yeah. Well, I, can, I can also tell you that I, I actually know um, someone else who, I, who was the co-writer of another film that dropped snuff. Mm. According to him, everyone that he knows is going to Good. Good, yeah. Well, there were too many great male violence movies, I guess, with Joker and 1917 and everything. The question I got was, you mentioned the aspect that, and by the way, I do not know the guy who wrote Joker. Oh, not him, good, okay. Well, that one didn't get snubbed, so I assumed, yeah. The movies that I outlawed had this fascinating career as kind of a 19th century pulp fiction writer. Mm -hmm. I kind of love that she's worked in the same vein as so many other New England authors like H.P. Lovecraft and Stephen King. Kind of. Yeah. And, uh, but she Stephen King went to see the movie, by the way, <laughs> and he liked it. He's on Twitter, sorry. Mm -hmm. and, you know, she made the leap to literary respectability, but do you ever get the feeling that she would have liked to have been writing genre fiction? Oh, yeah, she, she said the... Yes, yes. A lot of people have written about that because she called the chill. Because once she hit it big with Little Women, she, you know, she was sort of chained to this, you know, children's literature because it was such a cash cow, and her family was very, very poor. And suddenly they were very wealthy, and she wanted to make as much money to make her parents and the end of their life as comfortable as possible, and make sure there was money for her heirs. Um, Anna married and had two boys, but she, um, her husband died when they were just little babies. So she was providing for them. She was providing for May's daughter because May died. And so she was. She really killed herself writing these children's books. But she said her natural, her natural um, inclination was for the lurid style. So she did like writing the pulp, the pulp fiction. One of the parts that I always had difficulty with is when um, Amy burns the manuscript. Mm -hmm. and, ah, yeah. And then, of course, then she's drowning, and so then you know, Joe somehow is able to say, well, you know, she's my sister, and that's what's really important. Yeah. But that always, I don't know, there was something about that that she was able to forgive well, and she's asked to for she's asked to forgive her right away, you know, even before she goes to bed, and that's just that rubs most of us the wrong way. Yeah, Amy should Amy should have to be punished a little bit more than she is. But so Amy's based on May, who was the youngest girl, and May and and Lizzie too, who was Beth had a very different childhood than Anna and Meg did. Um, Anna and Meg, who were the oldest, or I'm sorry, Anna, who was Meg, and Anna and Louisa had to, they had to go out and work, right? They, they moved away from home and worked really hard. Um, uh, Anna was a teacher in a, in a school of mentally handicapped children, and she sent money home, and, uh, and, and Louisa had, she went off and worked as a domestic worker in a home for a while, and she ran a kindergarten. They're doing all these things. They didn't get to go to school, right? They had to go out and work to provide for the family. We didn't talk about Bronson Alcott, but that's why. Um, you know the story, because um, you all are from here. But, uh, but uh, so May, when she, by the time May came along, Right, she got to go to school. Um, you know, family members provided for her. She got to, you know, be trained as an artist. All these different things that Anna, that that Louisa felt like she had to work really hard for. May had always the cream of things, she said, and so I think that comes through in her portrayal of Amy. Amy's let off much more easily. She was a she's a little girl. She made a mistake. I really like what Greta Gerwig does with that scene, actually, because she has Amy tell Joe, I wanted to hurt you, and all you really care about is your writing. So that was the first time that what she did started to make sense to me. I don't have sisters, but I've had I actually had a whole interesting Twitter conversation a couple of days ago because people have been saying that this film and Florence Pugh's portrayal of her has rehabilitated Amy. Suddenly now people like Amy again, right? And we never liked her before. But there was a piece that came out a couple of days ago that said Amy still sucks. That was the title of it. 
<laughs> and so I put that on Twitter and asked people, what do you think? And I got a lot of registry responses, but the ones that really made sense were people who could identify with the sibling rivalry aspects of it, right? The difficulties that sisters have, uh, how they know just how to hurt each other, things like that. So that made sense to me. Yes. I'm curious about the chapter with um, Meg and John when Meg has the babies and she's yeah. and he starts going out at night. I, I, they did that then. I would I mean, like to see that on film too. That'd be a good one. When, was trying, but the, when she tried to change her ways that night and putting the baby to bed. Yeah. I, I Sleep training. Sleep. What? Who knew sleep training was in you know. Like, you know, novel 150 years ago. It's very contemporary. And what I really love about what, what she does with that, you know, so um, Meg feels like she has to be the perfect wife. And then she feels like she has to be the perfect mother. And Marmy comes along and tells her, you know what, you don't have to do everything. It's killing you here. Let John into the nursery. Let Hannah watch the kids some nights and you go out with John, right? This is something that I think young mothers still need to hear today because we still think when we have kids that we have to give up everything and do everything for our children. We are the, it, it, the buck stops with us, right? If anything bad happens, it's all our fault, right? We still to put so much pressure on mothers. So that's, a, I would love to see a whole uh, movie that's about Meg maybe, right, and what she goes through. Because that's important stuff still, very important. Over here, and then we'll go to the back. <laughs> the person who had never read the book, and maybe never saw any of the previous mm -hmm. followed because the chronology yeah. Could you all hear her question? Okay. Well, I I think it varies. I've heard from people who uh, haven't seen it before, didn't know the story that they could follow it. Interestingly, on Christmas Day, I dragged my family out to see it. Uh, we were with my in-laws. So my husband came, my father-in-law, my brother-in-law, and his wife and girls and my daughter. My father-in-law had not been in a movie theater since 1981. The last movie he saw in a theater was Chariots of Fire. Yeah, but he wanted to come because he's so excited about, you know, what I've done with this and the attention the book's gotten and stuff. It was really sweet. And he really liked it, and he wants to see it again. I think what he felt was that, you know, he, he could kind of get it, but he needed to see it again to really let it sink in. Yeah, to really kind of... And I have to say there's one jump in particular that every time I see it, I'm like, wait, where, where are we? Are we in the, it's when, um, when Beth's dying and they keep going back and forth between the old and the new and I get confused. So even, you know, so even if you've seen it, know it so well. With the Beth scene or just overall? Well, she's trying to tell the story. She's trying to make the story new to us because we know it so well. And she's juxtaposing um, different scenes that, that appear in different parts of the book, but in some cases she's making a bit of a commentary. For instance, right after Beth dies, the next thing that happens is Meg's wedding, which is a little jarring, but I've heard some people say that this is actually an interesting commentary, right? It's the ending. Do we end with death or, or marriage, right? Or is marriage itself a kind of death? And that's certainly how... Um, women have felt in the past, right? It's certainly the death of your old self, right? You even take a brand new name, you have, you know, not, not as much anymore, but back then you were, she was Mrs. John Brooke. She wasn't Meg March anymore, right? So there's kind of an interesting, there's an opportunity to make some interesting connections and commentaries. That's why I kind of want to see it again, because I feel like, I feel like the movie is so rich with these metatextual elements and the way she's retold the story, made these juxtapositions, that you could, each time you watch it, notice new things and get new things out of it. It certainly is, is a text that is meant to be uh, read or watched, rewatched, analyzed, right? And that's, I think, what makes it a work of art. I think she's a very ambitious young filmmaker, and that's also part of the reason that she, she, she did that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah. Usually when you see a flashback, it's a narrative sort of sequence that I don't confess to have followed every Yeah. Flash, but I've never seen a film done that before. And I thought it was really neat. I thought it was really neat. Oh, yeah. 
Um, well, the, so they didn't do this as much, but the Broadway musical in 2004 and the 1998 uh, opera both start with scenes later in the, in the story. Uh, the opera actually starts with when Lori comes back from Europe, and comes up to Joe's attic and, you know, let's slip that he and Amy are married. That's how that one starts. And then, and Joe is like, you know, she, everything's changing too fast. And she has this beautiful song where she talks about change. And then we go back to the beginning and we see her fighting change the whole way. So that sets up a kind of theme, a kind of different narrative arc for the story. Um, so that sort of thing is done a lot, right? Framing the story, uh, starting in the middle or starting in the end. I mean, you know, I've been, I've been trying to learn a lot about writing narrative nonfiction, and that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to start later and then go back to the beginning, that sort of thing. But this kind of going back and forth is, is I think, a bit new and unusual. I don't know enough about contemporary film to say that it's never been done or to compare it to others. That's a really good point, though. I'm going to look out for that. It's interesting. Yes? I was wondering if you could share a little about something I just learned about recently, which is that the reason they offer Jewish roots on the mother's side? Oh. All I know, and it's been a while since I've read that article. I think Eve LaPlante wrote the article. Uh, was it in the foreword? I do know that piece, and it's been a while since I read it. Nobody else has ever heard about that before either. She's, she uncovered that. Eve LaPlante is a great scholar. She's a local. Um, she um, is a descendant not very directly, but through like cousins or something, a descendant of the Alcotts. And she wrote a wonderful book called Marmee and Louisa that I highly recommend. And if you're interested, we talked a little bit about the character of Marmee. There's a great piece that came out in the New York Times just a couple days ago about, about Marmee. Like, we're seeing her with new eyes now. Through This is the first time she's ever sat on the big screen. I'm angry nearly every day of my life. There's more to that scene that Greta Gerwig could have put in, but at least she says it. And um, anyway, it's a really great piece, and I'm not just saying that because I'm quoted in it. <laughs> just you know, she interviewed me for it, but she also interviews Eve Laplante, and she wrote a great book, Marmy and Louisa, and she also published what has remained of Abigail Alcott's journals. This woman lived a very difficult life, and she um, she burned a lot of her things. The Alcotts kept journals, just you know like crazy, they'd write down everything. But she, she wanted to destroy some of that, and actually after she died, she wanted Bronson and Louisa to destroy what was left. And when Bronson read those journals, he could not believe what his wife had suffered, and he didn't know, he didn't realize. He was oblivious, let's just say that, <laughs> in lots of ways. But, um, but Eva Plant actually says in that article that uh, that she that a six-hour miniseries has been an adaption of an adaption six-hour miniseries adaption of her book Marmy and Louisa has been made and they're trying to sell it and that would be incredible maybe we'll see the real Marmy on film if that gets made I know that's not an answer to your question but it just reminded me of that but yeah that is a really very interesting piece that I didn't know about before either mm -hmm. yes. In terms of men being interested in this um, expertise of business and commerce, friends of mine, and say mm -hmm. that economics has anything to do with the technological route, mm -hmm. and via household management, mm -hmm. and with sister and brotherhood from sea to shining sea, it will women be because of the other economic experts. Yes. I'm wondering whether anybody who's addressed this fact you find in this book, the road begins Walden to the chapter of this economy. Yeah. You give a modern economic age, what do we do with it? I have insights from the women that can serve us. Um, have you seen the new movie yeah. yet? Okay. Well, well, Greta Gerwig has said that for her, Little Women is a book about women, money, and art. Money, she thought, was one of the main themes of the book. And it is, right? And there's a great speech that she gives Amy in the, in the movie that's not in the book where she explains to Lori that um, for a woman, marriage is an economic proposition, right? Because 
First of all, if you don't have your own money, you have to marry into money. And this pressure is being put, in, put on Amy to marry somebody uh, with money, because Meg didn't, Joe's not going to, and, and Beth is sick. So you know, Aunt March tells her that you're now the hope of the March family. She puts this pressure on her, and it's a really great scene. In fact, she added that speech because Meryl Streep told her, um, Greta Gerwig, I guess when they were filming, she's like, you know, you kind of have to explain this more to people because uh, what she's doing is giving us a little historical background that Louisa May Alcott didn't have to give her readers because they knew that already, right? But I think today a lot of especially young uh, viewers would need to be reminded of that. And that she also says that if a woman, uh, after a woman does marry, uh, she no longer has the right to her own property or her children either, right? So, so that, that will interest you, I think. And she really pulls out the themes of the, the compromises that women had to make to sell their writing, right? Because Joe is negotiating with the publisher, and she actually says to um, the publisher, she says, well, if, uh, if marriage is an economic proposition in life, I guess it is an art, too. Because that's how she's able to sell her book, is by marrying off her heroine. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would agree with you there, and Greta Gerwig definitely saw it that way. Well, I know we've been here a long time. Thank you for staying and talking about it. I had so much fun. Thank you.